Let's ask God's blessing. Father, thank you again for the privilege to come into your most holy presence this morning. We thank you for the great salvation we have through the shed blood of your Son and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who took on human flesh, became God incarnate. Lord, we can't understand that. But he did it, and we celebrated, we celebrated it on Christmas Day. We don't know if that's, the, that's not necessarily the day that it happened, but it's the day that we celebrate the incarnation of your Son. And he became incarnate so that he could die and pay the full price of our sin debt, which he did on the cross of Calvary, shedding his precious blood to pay the full price of the atonement. He died, he was buried, he rose the third day, death could not hold him, and he sits now at your right hand, having risen into that position, Lord, and we wait for a soon return. We thank you for the inerrant word that we, you have for us, preserved down through the ages. We thank you for that, and we thank you for the privilege that we can gather together without fear of persecution. We thank you, Lord, for the great love you commended towards us, and that why were we yet sinners? Christ died for us. We could not do anything. All our acts of righteousness are as filthy rags. And Father, we thank you, Lord, for the fellowship we have as we gather together this morning around your word. Help us uh, to uh, listen with understanding that we might apply to our lives something that goes out. Your word never goes out and comes back void. And Lord, we just thank you for all that you provide. And thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. So I was telling Conrad I'd like to finish up in a couple weeks. I mean, this is a lot of history. And uh, it's, just, uh, it's just interesting. This, this book is, well, we'll get to that. So I'm on page 100. And I'm just going to pick up where we left off last week, which was there in verse 39. The children of Israel and the children of Levi shall bring the offering of the corn and of the new wine and the oil unto the chambers, where are the vessels of the sanctuary and the priests that minister and the porters and the singers, and we will not forsake the house of God. So they have, they got the wall built, they've got, they're positioning people in different places. Uh, the temple, there is a temple there. And now, it's interesting, the temple, what, what is the one thing that is, was there that was not in the temple? It was the Ark of the Covenant and the, the, the cherub. That was got there. So you always kind of wonder what the priests did on the Day of Atonement because there was no mercy seat, so to speak, physical mercy seat. Uh, there in, in the in the temple, some say that they he went in and just sprinkled the blood on the on the rock that that it all sat on. But remember, our mercy seat is not a physical box. Christ is our mercy seat. He's the one that we go to uh, with our prayers and with our uh, intercession. We go we go to the our heavenly Father, but we go in the name of His Son. Uh, who bore his sins in our body? So in ver chapter eleven, as we as we move along, they're trying they're putting much of what's going on here at this time in history in in, in Israel and in Jerusalem and in, in that area is they're putting their house in order for worship and for service. In verse one, and the rulers of the people dwelt at Jerusalem, and, and the rest of the people also cast lots to bring one tenth to dwell in Jerusalem, the holy city, and nine parts to dwell in other cities. So they're still they're still organizing in, in a way. We have people that have come back from uh, captivity. Now remember, the captivity of Judah and Benjamin was in Babylon. The other ten tribes were scattered by the Assyrians. They weren't necessarily hauled off into, into one place. They were just scattered. So it's really the focus here is on Judah and Benjamin, the two southern tribes that were taken into captivity. And that's where the king is gonna come from, from the tribe of Judah. And, and, and his soon return, uh, hopefully is, is soon here. So now they're bringing people into the city uh, they're going to bring one tenth. They wanted one tenth of the people that were there. And we're talking about Israelites to live inside the walls of Jerusalem itself, and then the other nine could be go back and live out in the land, 
in the area where their possessions used to be before they got taken into captivity in that area. And so they and so nine parts to dwell in other cities scattered scattered about. And verse two, and the people blessed all the men that willingly offered themselves to dwell at Jerusalem. See what was going to happen is they were going to have to cast lots. You know, and if your lot fell uh, such and such, you would have to go and live in the city of Jerusalem. But a great blessing occurred because there were people who basically volunteered to do it and therefore the casting of the lot wasn't necessary. There was those who willingly offered to dwell in the city. What a great blessing it is when people are willing to sacrifice their own comfort and own, well, and own well-being for the, for the well-being of others. That, that is a great blessing when people are willing to go, you know, and, and give up their well-being or give up their comforts or give up their convenience and go and do something for the well-being of somebody, something, somebody else. Though they, they, they no longer had to draw lots and, were, and they were thankful for those that volunteered. In verse 3, now these are the chief of the province that dwelt in Jerusalem, but in the cities of Judah dwelt everyone in his own possession in their cities, to wit Israel, the priests, and the Levites, and the Nethanims, and the children of Solomon's servants. Now the province, so we're talking, most, most of what's going on here now is in Judah and Benjamin. If, if you look on a map where the city of Jerusalem is, and you look where the boundaries of Benjamin and Judah are, it looks like Jerusalem really is, is, is as much in Benjamin as it is in Judah, the city itself. So it, it talks about here the, 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 chief of the, the, the chief of the province. The province is basically Judah. And so it's a province, it's a Jewish province in a Persian kingdom, I guess is the best way to describe it, because they were going to have a certain amount, actually a large amount of, of autonomous rule. And so, uh, so it, they have here the, uh, but in the cities of Judah, everyone in his possession in their cities to which Israel. Now the distinction between Judah and Israel that existed during Rehoboam's reign as the king of Judah until the captivity no longer existed. I mean, there was no northern tribes. There was no northern kingdom of, 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 Ju of Israel. And there was no southern kingdom of Judah. But most of the people that came back from the captivity would be from the tribes of Benjamin and Judah. Even though people from the other ten tribes who were in the Persian Empire at that time were offered the opportunity to come back, and some did. But they could not come back to their lands. Why couldn't they come back to their lands? Do we remember why? What did the Assyrians do? They took them out of the thing, but what did they do? They then took people from other nations and they brought them into the northern <coughs> ten tribes and put them in the land. So the land now belonged to other people. But it always is going to belong to Abraham's seed, even today. And that's what, you know, what's part of the fighting that's going on there is to hang on to what they got so far. So we have, we have that going on there. And then in verse 4 on, on page 102, And at Jerusalem dwelt certain of the children of Judah, of the children of Benjamin, and of the children of Judah, at Ahiah, the son of Uzziah, the son of Zechariah, the son of Amariah, the son of Shephatiah, the son of Mahalalel, of the children of Perez. So, okay, so at Jerusalem dwelt certain people of, of Judah, and of the children of Benjamin. Again, I, I, as we go through this, we have to understand that genealogies are so important to the Jew because God is not finished with the Jew. And so they're trying to, pre they're preserving genealogies. They've purified the people, the people that could not identify themselves with some evidence of being Jewish. We're told until the Urim and the Thurim comes, you know, you're out. And so in First Chronicles chapter 9, verse 13, and we see there's, there's some contrast here and some similarity. So all Israel was reckoned by their genealogy. See how important it was? All reckoned by their genealogies. 
And behold, they were written in the book of the kings of Israel and Judah who were carried away to where? Babylon. See, not, no, the Syrians aren't even mentioned here. Now the first inhabitants that dwelt in their possession in their cities, the Israelites, the priests, the Levites, and the Nethanims. And in Jerusalem dwelt the children of Judah and of the children of Benjamin and of the children of Ephraim and Manasseh. So Ephraim and Manasseh were the northern two tribes. So some of, some of those people did come back and were there. They were able to identify themselves. In fact, not every single person in the northern tribes was scattered. There were always some that hid out, remember, even in, in, in the Babylonian captivity, there were certain of the people that hid from the Babylonians and didn't get hauled off into captivity and then they showed up a little later. Well, we're three or four or five generations down the road now and a few of these people are saying, I'm a Jew, I'm from the tribe of Manasseh, I'm from the tribe of Ephraim, both of which are from the tribe of Joseph. And so, and so Jerusalem in times past and here mostly belonged to the tribes of Judah and Benjamin. But there were a few from the other tribes also present in the city. And, of the, and so we see at this point heavy emphasis on the genealogy and communications from God because God is about to go silent. No more prophets for four, about 400 years. There'll be, there'll be no more message directly from God. The last of the prophets is coming off. The, uh, uh, we've got one prophet to go when all this is done, and that is John the Baptist. But that would be 400 years down the road. So we have this period of time now. It's going to be 400 years of basic silence. When you look at it, it it's going to start in the per when the Persians are, are the world power. It's going to change John the Baptist is going to come when the Roman Empire is in power. So what we understand, we see that the entire Greek Empire, Alexander the Great coming and going and, and the division, all that's going to take place during a period of time in which there's no godly prophecies. Now we have books that have been written, people, historians have written books. Josephus is, is a historian. There are other books that are written, that, historical books. They're not scripture. The Lord clearly identified scripture uh, in, in a couple of places in the Bible. We'll go to those at some point in time. But he identified from, from Adam to, to uh, Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, who you slew between the altar and the, and the temple. That is recorded in Second Chronicles at the, at the end. So Second Chronicles is the end of the Old Testament. And then the New Testament starts with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So there's 400 years. So we need to, need to understand that. The Chronicles are the last book of the Old I'm at the bottom of page 102. The last book of the Old Testament to be written. In Matthew 23, verse 35, that upon, here's, what, here's, what, here's the Lord, see how important these, every word is. Here's the Lord establishing the content of the Old Testament. He says here, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel, recorded in Genesis, unto the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, Rias, recorded in Chronicles, whom you slew between the temple and the altar. This verse in Matthew is where the Lord identified the first and last books of Scripture that existed in his day. He identifies them. He did it. And so and now we go into these 400 years of silence that's going to be coming upon us. Well, we're still back in Nehemiah here, verse 6 on page 103. All the sons of Perez that dwelt at Jerusalem were 403 score and eight valiant men. Uh, we note that we have value, we have valiant men, and they were uh, dwelt in Jerusalem. Why would you have valiant men in Jerusalem? Because of what's going on today in Israel. They're defending their existence there. They're fight right now. They're fighting in Gaza so that they do not have to fight in Jerusalem. They had to fight in Jerusalem in 1948. They had to fight. They had to fight the the. The Arabs, they had to fight the British. <laughs> the British were pro-Arab. They may be pro-Arab even today, I don't know. 
but there's very few that are pro-Israel, pro maybe down to one, and that waning, unfortunately. Verse 7, And these are the sons of Benjamin, the Salu, the son of Meshulam, the son of Jod, the son of Padaiah, the son of Koliah, the son of Masaiah, the son of Ithiel, the son of Jesaiah, after him, Gebiah, Selai, 920 and 8. So these are the sons of Benjamin, so Benjamites. So you got Israel, you got Judah, Judahites, and you got Benjamites. The tribes are important. The tribes are important. The tribes are so important. 900 men of, Ju of Benjamin are cataloged essentially twice the number of Judah. That's interesting because Benjamin was the smallest of, of the little tribes. And here, they turn out to be the, the greatest in number coming back. And so, in verse 9, down the bottom, I know I'm going quickly, but you can read these other things that I've put in there. I don't think we need to, to, to cover them. And Joel, the son of Zikri, was their overseer, and Judah, the son of Sanua, was second over the city. So, here again, I, I mentioned they're putting their house in order, not only uh, from, a, from a spiritual point of view, but from a, a uh, secular point of view. They're, they're organizing, people being in charge. You know, uh, what the world seems to want today is they want anarchy. Everybody wants to do whatever they want to do, whenever they want to do it, wherever they want to do it. They don't want to obey laws. Uh, when you don't have laws, you have anarchy. And uh, they didn't want that there. They they wa they wanted law and order, and so and so they have to put people in charge. We 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 we're going to vote here next year and during the the, the thing for people to run our country and to run our state and to run our government, our our our, our county and to run our city and to run our park. We're going to we're going to vote for people here in January to to manage our park, and they will, they can they can make decisions that some will affect us in in a, in a small way, and, and some may affect us in a very large way. But that's that's kind of put doing things in order. And so, he was their overseer. This man Zikri, Zikri, and Judah, the son of Sanua, was second. So they had a deputy. They didn't give him necessarily a title but they give him a position. So, in verse 10, of the priest, now we turn to the religious aspect of it. Uh, the, so, so, so important to the Jew, his, 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 his religious, his godly service. Of the priest, Jedaiah, the son of Jorib, um, uh, Jason. Of the, these were, I believe, the priests are named here in First Chronicles chapter 9, verse 10, of the priest, Jedaiah and Jehorarib and Jason. I believe that Ezra is the I believe Ezra is the author of Chronicles, and that we can see that he incorporated some of the events from Nehemiah. You can see that. So, in in verse eleven, Seraiah the son of Hilkiah and the son of Meshulam the son of Zadok the son of Marioth, the son of Ahitub, was the ruler of the house of God. So now you have a ruler taking care of the secular aspects of the city. And now you have people taking uh, management control of the house of, of worship. There has to be, what's the last verse of 1 Corinthians 10, 15, let all things be done decently and in order? Well, that's, in the house of God, that's the way it should be done also. And so we have these rulers set up here. In verse 12, and their brethren that did the work of the house were 820 and two. That's, that's a lot of folks. <laughs> there was a lot of people involved in the, in the worship services of, of the Jew. A lot of people. And, uh, and Adaiah, the son of Jehoram, and uh, Peliah, the son of Amzi, and the son of Zechariah, the son of Pashur, the son of Malachiah, and his brethren, chief of the fathers, 240 and 2, and as Amashai, the son of Azarel, the son of Ahaziah, the son of Meshillah, oh boy, the son of Immer, 
and their brethren, mighty men of valor, 128. Their overseer was Zabdiel, the son of one of the great men. So again, we saw that we talked about valiant, val men of valor before. Now we get a little bit of insight into who they are and who, and who had leadership over them. And so the uh, these, uh, brethren did the work of the house were 822. These seem to be those that maybe offered the sacrifices, uh, burnt the incense, uh, set on the showbread. All of these were... All of these were types of Christ, the showbread and the candle showing he's the light of the world, the, the ins, altar of incense, the incense going up, the prayers of the people, the, the labor, the cleansing of, 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 and the, of, of the, his blood, uh, the labor, the washing of the hands, the, the cleansing, and then the, the brazen labor with the sacrifice is given, his sacrifice. It's, it's all a picture uh, the temple and the tabernacle were all a picture of Christ, a physical picture of, of, of someone, uh, of a person. Uh, and so these mighty men of value, hundred, these uh, were either men of courage or strength, as in Chronicles described them as, in there at the bottom of page 105, as very able men for the work of the service of the house of God. You know, they may have been, they may have been good workers, strong workers, uh, I suspect that, you know, you could actually get tired. You know, we don't look at that. But, you know, you, when you're serving the Lord, you can get tired in the work, but hopefully never tired of the work. You find a lot of preachers who really preach on Sunday and preach in the morning, maybe teach in the morning, preach at night, and they preach and they preach and they do their best to get God's word out to people. When they go home Sunday night, they probably don't have much trouble sleeping because they, they are tired in the work. You know, they've given it their, their best. Verse 15, also of the Levites, page 105, Shemaiah, the son of Hashub, the son of Azarkam, the son of Hashabiah, the son of Bunai, the son of Shabbatai, and Jazabad, of the chief of the Levites, had the oversight of the outward business of the house of God, and so the outward business. Now, what what would that might what might that be? Well, I think it has to do with the the outward business has to do with the interface with the secular society. If you're going to have, if you're going to have, we we have our, in our churches we have interface with secular things. First of all, the electricity that comes into our building, we have to pay our bills for that, and sometimes we have to have things done. You got phone service, you got water service, you've got all these other kinds of things, maybe if there's food and things. So we, we deal with, with non-religious entities on a secular basis. And so these people here in particular, because it was such a part of their daily life, there were people that would dealt with the outward business of the house of God. And I think that has to do with society. They had to get animals, right? There would be animals that would become the, for the sacrifices. In verse 17, And Mataniah, the son of Micah, the son of Babdi, the son of Asap, was the principal to begin the thanksgiving in prayer. And Bakukiah, the second among the, his brethren, and uh, Abda, the son of Mashua, the son of Galal, the son of Jethudun. Jethudun. Okay, so now these were, this was a hymn leader. Yep. Churches have, what do they call them? They call them uh, uh, some kind of praise leaders. As they get up there, you know, jump around and stuff. We don't do that. But, you know, we do have a song leader. You know, you, you need some. If if you're not singing on on in, on key and you're not singing on time, you know, the listening ear it sounds like the Tower of Babel. You know, if you got a large congregation, so you have a song leader up there that tries to get you started on the right note, tries to get you in in the right tempo, and then tries to stop you and start you when you go. You know, so the people it was people that needed to do that. 
they must have, they, I think they did a lot more of this than we do in our churches. We maybe sing a few hymns during a service. I suspect they did a lot more singing in, in their services than we did. Remember, how long was it when Ezra was standing on the platform and giving out the word? They were standing there for three hours and maybe longer. But, you know, so I suspect that their service, that when the temple thing was going on, and maybe it went on all through the day and people could come and go at different times. We don't know, but we do know that people were dedicated to this particular service here. In verse 18, all the Levites in the holy city were 200, <laughs> four score, and five. So the Levites... So these were, these were usually when we do them, these were not priests, these were not the high priests, these were not the priesthood who were Levites, but these were Levites who were not priests that were required, that did the work of, of, uh, of, of the temple that didn't involve the priesthood, the wood and the water and the things like that, the cleaning and you know, the cleaning up of the area, the, the policing of the place. They didn't have paper cups and styrofoam in those days, but I assure you, dirt will find, dirt and stuff will find its way in no matter where what you, you know what your society is. In verse 19, moreover, the porters, Akub, Talmon, and their brethren that kept the gates, were 172. Now that's a lot of people, but there's a lot of gates in Jerusalem. Remember, as we looked through and around around the map, there's a lot of gates. See, we have, we have an open border. We used to have gates into this country. We used to have Ellis Island, and the people came into New York Harbor. And they saw the Statue of Liberty, and they praised the Lord. And they came in, and they registered. And if they had family there, they got to go, and they, a little, they got taught our Constitution and caught the pledge. And they, they, they accepted our culture, and they had a ceremony in which a judge would preside them citizens of our country and they could vote and they had all the opportunities of everybody else and we've taken all of that and we've thrown it in the trash these people weren't about to do that at least at this time in history so they're going to control who came and went from the in and out of their city and in and out of their temple and so they were porters, and it says that there were 172 of them. So, you know, all, all those gates probably always had more than, certainly more than one person at a gate, probably more than two, maybe four, maybe six, who know, I don't, we don't know. But if you took all the gates and then you divided them into time, the watches, I mean, you know, the gates were guarded all the time. Verse 20, page 106, And the residue of Israel of the priest and the Levites were all in the cities of Judah, everyone in his inheritance. See, the, uh, the, Jew, the, the, the people from the land of Judah and Benjamin, they could go back to where, you know, they, they, they lived, their families lived before they went into captivity. Because for the most part, the land was barren at that point in time. And uh, the Babylonians didn't go in and resettle it. You know, they didn't do what the Assyrians did, brought, brought people in and repopulated the, play, the northern tribes. They didn't do that in the south. So a person could go back to where their family once was and, you know, maybe nothing was there, maybe everything, you know, but they could start in that place, you know, to rebuild and whatever they needed to do to establish themselves there. And so they went back, and it says, everyone to his, to his inheritance. But the Nethanims dwelt in Ophiel, and Ziha and Gispa were over the Nethanims. Now, the Nethanims are an interesting group of people. I think they might be the Jebusites that, that uh, faked out Joshua when, when he failed to ask the Lord who these people were. They pretended to be people who they weren't. And so Joshua accepted them and then later found out that they weren't who they said they were. But it was already too late. He had already accepted them. So they were made servants. You know, they were, they were, that was their job. They were made servants. I guess, you know, they got taken care of. I mean, they, 
but they, they did servant type of work. They carried wood. They did those kinds of things. If you remember our map, when you looked at the, at the map of, of Jerusalem, when we held it up like this, you look at down in the lower right-hand corner is where the Nethanims would, would have lodged themselves. So they were all required I guess, to be in one area. They couldn't spread themselves all out. They had no inheritance. So they, had, they lived by the city. They lived in the, what we would call the suburb. <laughs> they were in the suburbs. So anyway, verse 22, the overseer also of the Levites at Jerusalem was Uzai, the son of Bani, and the son of Hashabiah, and the son of Mataniah, the son of Micah, the son of Asaph. The singers were over the business of the house of God. Okay, the singers. We recognize Asaph a lot because if you look in the Psalms, you know, you see a lot of, a lot of the Psalms were written by Asaph. And apparently he has the singers, the sons of Asaph, the singers over the business of the house of God. Music was a very, music is a very important part of worship for our God. It's very part. It's part of worship. A lot of things, but but the God, the true and only living God, talks about it in the Bible. Talking yourselves in hymns and psalms and things. Nothing wrong with singing a hymn around the house, or you're driving, or something like that, or humming it. Nothing wrong with that. In fact, it's a good, a good way to remember certain things. So we have this man here. Back in verse 15, we read that of those that had responsibility for the external maintenance of the temple area, now we have those who are responsible for the internal workings. They all, see, they all, nobody could go into that temple except he was a Levite. The other tribes were not allowed. They were allowed into the temple outside area, the courtyard area, but never inside the temple, only Levites. So here we have the responsibility of those inside. There was the making of the oil. Okay, now all these things were part of the Jewish religion there. The oil the, for the candlesticks, the incense, they had to make that. It was, uh, they have it all here. The uh, spices, the wine, the vessels of service, the cleaning of everything. It was all, it was all, it was all, you know, works kind of thing. It was a, it was it was a, it was a, uh, it was a practice that they had to do in a certain way and with certain things. It was all laid out for them by the Lord in the law. He gave Moses all the information: what to build, what to serve, what the what to, what the incense was made of, what the oil. It was all given to them in the law, and they're still functioning under the law here. Doing their best. No, there's no, there's no mercy, mercy seat there. So a lot of things have happened. A lot of things are gone. A lot of people are gone. But they're they're trying they're trying to do the best they can with what they have. Verse twenty three. For it was the king's commandment concerning them that a certain portion should be for the singers, due for every day. I found this kind of interesting. For a certain portion for the singers do every day. We'll get to that. Ezra chapter 7, verse 24. We also certify you that touching any of the priests and Levites, singers, porters, nethodims, or ministers of the house of God, it shall not be lawful to impose toil, tribute, or custom upon them. So it seems like the singers, you know, again, part of their religious practice was singing. We talk about cantors. We don't hear much of Jewish cantors anymore, but you know you can go on is on YouTube, and if you want to hear a uh, synagogue service in which the cantor is singing, some of it is very, of course, would be in Hebrew, and you wouldn't understand the words, but you can hear it. And so uh, the, these singers here are given special emphasis. You know why? You know. Who's the king involved here, I guess is the question. Which king is being addressed here? Which king is in view? Is, is, uh, it could be the Persian king, or it could be, uh, or it could be, or it could have been King David. You know, when he set all this up, remember King David was the one who set up all these, all the service of the temple and everything, even though he didn't build it. 
He had a lot to do, a lot to do with the, the service of it. He broke the uh, the service of the uh, of the Levites, or the priests actually, because Zechariah, Elizabeth's husband, was a priest, son, father of John the Baptist. Remember, he was of the course of Abiah. He was in there putting incense in the incense burner. So there was 24 of those courses, and everybody served for couple weeks or a week or whatever it is and so it could have been David you know that said that you, you laid this out or it could have been the king of Persia who uh, at the request of maybe uh, uh, Nehemiah requested this be, be the case because remember it is still a Persian kingdom these people were still uh, required to obey Persian law they were given a lot of flexibility, but they were still in a Persian nation. There were still Persian soldiers around. There were Persian governors around. We, we know from all the chaos that during the early building of the wall that those people outside that were against him may have very well have been in Persian office, may, may have had titles and a certain amount of authority. In verse 24, and Petaliah, the, the son of Mesha Zebal, of the children of Zerah, the son of Judah, was at the king's hand in all matters concerning the people. So now that's an interesting thing, thing here too. So what's going on here? Well, there's always, you get something like that that just comes out of nowhere, no, no leading into it or anything. It's just a statement of fact, a, a historical fact this, this is true there is this person Pethahiah Peth, the son of Meshelezebel so we, we can identify him they can trace him back in history of the children of Zerah the son of Judah so he's, he's from the tribe of Judah he was at the king's hand well there is no king in Israel there's only one king locally that can be addressed here and that's the king of Persia so he must be a person, I believe he's a person in the king's court that is a Jew. Now we know of other people that were in the king's court that were Jews. First of all, Esther was queen. <laughs> she was a Jew. And, uh, and uh, her uncle, uh, the, uh, he was, he was in, in the court. And so we know, and Nehemiah was, the, he, was the, he was the cup bearer. So maybe there's an ambassador there. This would be a Jewish person reporting on, on things Jewish going on in, in the area. He would be required to get, maybe give an account. This is what's going on. King, there's so-and-so, Nehemiah, well, Nehemiah was maybe back or off the scene here. Uh, but he would go back and maybe report this is what's going on here or something. We send ambassadors to countries all the time. And sometimes, you know, so, uh, you know, we don't have any more detail than what we have here. Verse 25, well, now we're in the villages here. Not, in, not here in Florida, but in the villages back in, in uh, this area of uh, Jerusalem. And for the villages with their fields, some of the children of Judah dwelt at Ke Kitjar Arba, and then the villages thereof, and then Deban, and then the villages thereof, and at Jezreel, and then the villages thereof, and at Jeshua, and at Jeshua, and at Moada, and Beth Philiat, and Hazashuel, and, and at Beersheba. Some of these names are familiar. We've seen them over and over Beersheba, and others like that. And the villages thereof, at Ziklag, and Nakona, and the villages thereof, and so on and so forth. So now, uh, these are the people are now g going back. Remember, the ten percent are in Jerusalem, the city. These are the people going out into the fields, at different places, different towns, different places where their ancestors used to live before the captivity, and now they're going back to establish homes and and uh, establish themselves there in the nation. They're not they're not establishing a nation here. They're Persian. They're living in Persia, but they're living auto autonomously. It's really great for them to be able to rule their own their own people, 
And that would work as long as there was no threat. So the children of Judah, specifically of this one tribe, remember most of Israel, the northern tribes, were scattered. So we've, we've talked about that. We understand that there'll be some of those folks, but not, not as many. Verse 31, And the children also of Benjamin from Geba dwelt at Michmash and Aijah and Bethel and in their villages and Anathoth. Anathoth is the place where Jeremiah was born. And uh, close to Jerusalem, Nob, Ananiah, Hazar, these are all familiar names that we would have read in other places in the Bible. Ramah and Gatam, Hadid, Zeboim, Zebalat, Lad, Ono, the Valley of, and the Valley of Craftsmen. So there's always a little something different in, in, in when you read God's word. You know, have all these names, go to a map and click, 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 click there. And then the Valley of Craftsmen? That's not Sears anymore, by the way. They don't. They don't handle craftsman tools anymore. I think Ace does. So Ace is your place. So anyway, the children of Benjamin. This would be the the other of the, the two southern tribes. First Chronicles 4.14. And Meonathiah begot Ophrah, and Seriah begot Joab, the father of the, of the valley of Kerashim, for they were craftsmen. So, you, you know, you, you get a little bit of, okay, so you got a, two little pieces of information here. The Valley of the Craftsman. So it's a place. And uh, and it's called here the Valley of Kerashim. So I don't know where that would be on the map. I haven't seen that. For they were craftsmen. It could be a pl perhaps a place where minerals and soils to cast and forge and metals was plentiful. And it could be a place where they could get the iron ore was available, maybe copper. You know, uh, they, they, they could handle metallurgy in those days. They, they understood copper and bronze and tin. I mean, and they, they knew how to forge. They knew how to mold. They did it with the sand and stuff. You know, we get this. Remember when you were young, you used to get bars of clay for, for Christmas, you know, you get them all over the house, you know, little pieces all in the furniture, Every, it goes everywhere. But you could all, you'd mold things, you'd rub it in your hand back and forth like this and you'd make long strings of it and then you'd, you'd do all that stuff and they could, you know, you could make a mold out of it if you wanted to. And they would do that with sand and with clay. Well, most of the, sand is not a good mold maker, but clay is. And form it and dry it. Anyway. I'm talking a lot about something I know nothing about. But anyway, verse 36, And of the Levites were divisions in Judah and in, Be in, and in Benjamin. I believe these are the courses for service. I believe we're talking about this, the service of the temple. Ezra chapter 6, 18, verse 18, And they set the priest in their divisions, same word, and the Levites in their courses, uh, for the service of God, which is at Jerusalem, as it is written in the book of Moses. So you see, if it's, if Scripture interprets Scripture. You, you have to go. You have to. You have to read this whole book. You have to study this whole book. We get information here, uh, reading Nehemiah, from the book of Chronicles, and you get things when you're reading the book of Chronicles from Nehemiah. And so you put it all together and you get a, a much, you get a picture of what's going on here. And, uh, and so we come to the end of chapter 12, uh, 11 rather, and we head into chapter 12. We get a start here today. Uh, one, uh, 1 through 26. So I, I, I alert you ahead of time. <laughs> Verses 1 through 26 lists the leading priest and Levites at different periods. The second part, verses 27 through 47, relates to the dedication of the wall. So as we go into chapter 12, we're going to read, and we can see over there in verse 12 on the other page to the side that it starts a whole lot of names. So important to the Jew. You know, but along the way, God always puts a little something along the way so that, you know, you can't, you can't ignore it. You may go over it a little quick, but you can't ignore it. Verse 1. Now these are the priests and the Levites that went up with Zerubbabel, the son of Shetiel, and, 
and Joshua, Joshua, Seriah, Jeremiah, Ezra, Amariah, Maluk, Hatush, Shechaniah, Rehum, Miramoth, Edo, Gitnitho, Abijah, Mim, Meadiah, Bilga, Shemaiah, Jehoiarib, Jedaiah, Salu, Amok, Hilkiah, Jedaiah. These were the chief of the priests and of their brethren in the days of Joshua. Zerubbabel is the governor. Remember, he came back. What did he come back to do? He came back to build the temple. Joshua is the high priest. See, they have, they, they, have, neither, Joshua is the high priest, but he hadn't been doing high priest things for a long time. Why? Because there was no temple. He couldn't do high priest things. And remember, there's a, I forget the verse where it is, but, you know, he, it points out he, talk, the Lord's talking about he came in dirty clothes. He had, to, he had to be cleaned up. His act had to be cleaned up. What happens is when you don't go to church often, it becomes very comfortable not to go. And you start to acquire the characteristics of, of, of rather of godly characteristics of secular and stuff. And, you know, you just feel very comfortable with it. You throw a couple of uh, thank yous in the air. You point your finger up, you know, you know, you think God, God is going to be interested in any of that. He's not, by the way. And so, 22 other priests are named. Within the 22, there seems to be a division. The last six are connected with the word and. See, there's a little subtle difference there in, in that list. It goes all the way through the list until you get to where? Until you get to, uh, uh, where was I? Uh, no, you get to here in verse 6. You get, you get to verse 6, it's go to Shemai, and, then the word and is in there. Everywhere else it's a comma. So what, what exactly is the significance? I'm not sure, but there's, it's a difference. Maybe it's because they were the chief of the priests. They were priests, but chief of the priests. Verse 8, moreover the Levites, Jeshua, Benai, Kadmiel, Sherebiah, Judah, and Mataniah, which was over the thanksgiving, he and his brethren. So these were these were the Levites living in that day. Some of them are mentioned in chapter 8 as assisting the people in their understanding. Remember, there was people alongside Ezra as he preached and taught that would go out into the crowds and, and repeat what Ezra said. They would give the sense and the application. And so these were some of these people mentioned here were those same people that were on that platform. This later man, Mataniah, was responsible for directing the songs in the temple, particularly the Thanksgiving song at the daily sacrifice. Verse 9, Baku, Aya, and Unai, their brethren, were over against them in the watches. So what's that all about? over against them in the watches. Well, you know, we know what watches are in the sense of military and security. We know what those are about. So it has something to do with that. In Psalm 134, verse 1, Song of Degrees, Behold, bless ye the Lord, all ye servants of the Lord, which by night stand in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. So we have people in that psalm there in, in verse 1. What do they do? Which by night stand in the house of the Lord. And why would they be doing that? They would be doing it because they were on watch. That's what you do when you're on watch in the military. You what? You don't sit watch. You stand watch. It's always who's standing watch. Not who's sitting watch tonight. Who's standing watch. It was always something you stood up. If you sat down, you're at you're, you're the risk of falling to sleep, especially in the mid-watch, 12 to 3 or 12 to 4. Anyway, we won't go there. David divided the Levites into 24 courses, those in each course serving the temple at their appointed time. And then I mentioned earlier, I won't read it here, but I mentioned Zacharias, the husband of, of, of Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist. He 
was attending in the temple on his course as a priest, the course of Abiah. They all had names. In verse 10, and Joshua begot Jeho Je Joachim, Joachim begot Elish Eliashib, Eliashib begat Joiada, Joiada begat Jonathan, and Jonathan begat Jadua. So here now we have a genealogy, not just a list, but an actual genealogy with the be with the begots. That's what it means. You know, father it could be a grandfather. By the way, sometimes when you go back and look at, at lists in the, in the Bible, sometimes you'll you'll start going the father of the father of the father of. And then you get a name that you don't under that's not familiar. Well, it might be a grandfather or a great grandfather or a great grandfather, but it's in the line. So sometimes in the Bible you won't get every dot in the line, but you will get the whole line, especially in the genealogies uh, for Mary and Joseph. You don't necessarily get each and every single person in the line, but you get a you. How many points does it take to make a straight line? Two. And three, you know, and three, and you know, that just fills in the line, the points in between. But that's what genealogies are for, so that you can trace back your heritage. And so in verses 12 through 16, here we go pretty quick. And in the days of Jehoiakim were priests, the chief fathers of of Sariah, Mariah, Jeremiah, and Hananiah, of Ezra, Meshulam, Amariah, and Jothanim. So these are the different uh, genealogies here, each a couple of short ones. Melaku, Jonathan, and Shebiah, and Joseph, of Harem, see, see the ofs. So that, that, that anchors, you know, the, uh, the genealogy. Of Haram, Adna, Marioth, Halkai, of Edo, Zechariah, Genethon, Meshulam. Note, if you look at the first verse in the book of Zechariah, you will see that Edo is the grandfather, his father being Berechiah. <laughs> so, you know, some of these are familiar. It says, of Edo, Zechariah. Well, there's a book of Zechariah. It's a very interesting book. It's a wonderful book to, to teach from. And a lot of, a lot of prophecy in there. A lot of prophecy. So the genealogies do, do not necessarily include. I just said all that, didn't I? Did not go and include all generations. I got ahead of myself. And then we have here in 17 through 21. And uh, we're going to uh, read these, and then then we'll be done for today. Of uh, Abijah, Zikri. Of Menahem, of Moadiah, Petel Tei, of Bilga, Shamua, Shemiah, Jehonathan, and of Jehoiarib, Matanei, of Jedidiah, Uzai. So you you got a couple of ofs in between. So they, they're you know moving moving along. Of Salai, Kalai, of Emuk. Eber, and then of verse 21 of Hilkiah, Hashabiah, of Jediah, Nathanil. So I think we'll just, we'll, we'll just stop there t today and uh, we'll pick up next week. Boy, it's hard to write 1324.